If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to uh, the prophecy of Malachi, or where if you've got electronic devices or whatever you use. Uh, the Italians call this Malachi, uh, but I will stick with Malachi. And the title of the message tonight is Worthless Worship. Worthless worship. And let's go ahead and read just a few of these verses. I'm not going to read the whole passage. We're going to th go through verses 6 through 14. But we'll just read a couple of these. Now, verse 6, first of all, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. Then if I am the father, who is my honor? Where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts, O you priests who despise my name. And then drop down to verse 10. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates that you might not usefully kindle the fire on my altar. We just sang about the altar. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. Well, that gives us an idea of what kind of warning and admonition that Malachi is getting into. And, and we'll get into the details of that in just a bit. But let me begin by categorically saying what we think about God is the most important thing about us. Let me say that again. What we think about God is the most important thing about us. And actually, let me make another categorical statement. At least it's categorical in my opinion. What we think about worship, how we think about worship, how we actually worship is a direct reflection of what we think about God. And also, an obvious question for us to honestly answer, what is acceptable worship? Or perhaps a related question, what is biblical worship? And before we get into the text in Malachi chapter 1, let's try to define true, genuine worship. In other words, let's try to define how true worship is defined in the Bible. So leave a marker there in Malachi chapter 1 and turn to the 30th chapter of the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 30. And the reason we're doing this is because having a biblical theology of worship is critical because everything that is called worship is not always worship. And all we have to do is go back to Genesis chapter 4. Don't go there, but just Genesis chapter 4 to see that where Cain and Abel brought their sacrifices as a part of worship and the Lord looked at, with favor on Abel as he was his offering, but Cain, his offering of worship, he had no regard for. And what was Cain's problem, other than the fact that he was jealous and stubborn and had a murderous rage to him, but he lacked the proper theology of worship. Cain brought an unacceptable sacrifice to, get to the Lord, and on top of that, he even demanded that the Lord accept that unacceptable sacrifice. And let me see if we can illustrate this in a couple of places in Scripture of this thought. I ask you to turn to Exodus chapter 30, and I trust this will provide a very graphic illustration. God had just given the children of Israel clear instruction about how worship was to be carried out in the tabernacle. They were, still hadn't entered the land yet. And there were many things that were part of that instruction, and it all had symbolic value, number one, and how they were to worship very... Uh, valuable teaching about the person of God. All that worship was centered on that. How do we look at God? How do we view Him? And this is what shaped their view. So Exodus chapter 30, beginning with verse 34. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take for yourself spices, tactic, and anica, and galbium, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing those correctly, and those were available elements in that part of the world, these sweet spices were with, and he combined them with pure frankincense, and there shall be an equal part of each one of those. With it, verse 35, you shall make incense perfume, the work of a perfumer. Moses was to take all the skills that he had and make a perfume that would honor the Lord. Um, and it was to be salty and pure and holy. And holy, actually, there is just being separated and unique, untouched, and only for God. Uh, verse 36, you shall beat some of it very fine and put it as part of before the testimony of the tent of the meeting where I will meet you. So God says, get this perfume, put it together, put it in the tabernacle, 
And where I meet you, it shall be most holy to you. And that is, it's not to be used for any other purpose than that. It's to be used only in the tabernacle. Verse 37, the incense which you shall make, you shall not make in the same proportions for yourselves. It shall be holy to you for the Lord. Uh, you cannot, the Lord says, you cannot, tells Moses, you cannot make this for any other reason. You can't have it as a personal thing. This particular recipe, in verse 38, it says, Whoever shall make any like this to use as a perfume for them personally, they shall be cut off from his people. Now, I would suppose that you didn't know, first of all, that there was a perfume recipe in the Bible. And this was probably the most eloquent, lovely fragrance imaginable. And God said, if you make it for yourself and use it for yourself, it could cost you your very life. Talk about tabernacle discipline. All right? Well, you say, what is the point? The point is this. Here was a fragrance designed only and for God. Here was a fragrance designed only to be for God. And the incense from that rose to him, his nostrils. It was unique for him. And it pictures an act of worship, a unique gift, a unique fragrance. And, and it's something that is to be offered to no other person but God. Uh, and it was, to, it was coming from the heart of one who's, who was giving this to the very nostrils of God, and that's symbolic of worthy worship. And look at verse 36 again. Where I will meet with you, it shall be most holy to you. When you come to meet the Lord there, let there rise from you something that is holy and is only directed at me. Now, if you will, turn in the New Testament to the Gospel of John. John chapter 12. And I want to share a similar thought here. And here we have a, another fragrant gift offered in worship, and this time it's to the living God in the human form, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And many of you know the story here. John chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard. And obviously we don't know exactly how costly this was. Most Bible commentators would estimate that this would probably be about a year's worth of wages. And if we were to look at to our current economic standing today, it might be between forty-five and fifty thousand dollars or so. Very costly. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume, pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And Paul says in the First Corinthians chapter eleven, the glory of a woman is her hair. And so Mary uses her glory for the lowliest task imaginable. Anybody in that part of the world who washed people's feet, that would have been the most menial type of task. The most menial slave would do something like that. But May, Mary uses her glory to wash the dusty, dirty feet of Jesus, and she doesn't just use water. She uses this extremely costly fragrance. That's the essence of worship, is it not? Worship really comes to the point of being self-humiliating. And worship is profuse in its giving. And remember that Mary and Martha, even though they were sisters, they were very different. Martha, bless her heart, was always serving. She was busy, 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 busy. And Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now Judas Iscariot, he's there. And he has a reaction to this, and he, he says, wait a minute, hold on, just a minute. That's 300 denarii. I, I mean, that's worth a lot of money. That's a year's worth of wages. We could give that to the poor. And Jesus didn't really care about the poor. Why? Because he was a thief. And he, and he had the money box, and he used to pilfer from the money box. But Jesus said, let her alone. Let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. 4, verse 8. 
you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Translation, letter alone, it's better to worship than to give to welfare. That's the point. And isn't that right? When one gives God, it's infinitely more important than what he gives to man. Now, that's not to say it's not important to give to meet some human needs. It is. But it is to say it's much more important to give to the Lord God. And you see, in our modern-day churches, we tend to be at times so busy doing church stuff. We're like a bunch of Marthas. And, I mean, we get all kinds of programs and all kinds of ministries and everything else, and we got to do this and we got to do that, and we got, you know, we're just busy doing all this stuff like a bunch of Marthas. Now, that's not necessarily bad. But we're not the Marys. And we need to mark out that very careful what we give to God rather than pour out that which is a year's wages. We pour it out, stooped in humility at the feet of Jesus. That's worship. That's worthy worship. That's not worthless worship. And rising out of that worthy worship is a sweet fragrance, a, a fragrant aroma, a pleasant scent, which God takes delight in. Amen? And he's honored and respected and revered when that happens. And that's the essence of worshiping a worshiping heart. And that's what God's after. True worship is better than welfare. True worship is better than religious activity. The welfare is necessary time, and so is activity, but worthy worship is better. Well, let's come back to Matthew chapter 1. Now, that's my first introduction. People are always uh, complaining about my long introductions, but I got a second one here because we got to set the context for what is said here. After Judah, that would be the southern two tribes of Israel, uh, the ten northern tribes were taken away uh, 70, 80 years before Judah was, but Judah was taken captive by the Babylonians under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar. And they spent 70 years in captivity, or most of them did. Some of them didn't come back. But after 70 years, some of them came back, and they came back under the rule of the Persians because the Persians had defeated the Babylonians. And as a result, the people had rebuilt the temple uh, and, and through the work of, and leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah, and they had rebuilt the walls of the city, and they were in the process of building, rebuilding the city. And for a while, there was a religious revival, if we could call it that. Um, but as the years passed, there was a total drift back into apostasy and unbelief. And this was actually more or less due to complacency. And complacency, complacency always eats at commitment, does it not? I call that bozoism. And someone once said the opposite of love is not necessarily hatred. The opposite of love is complacency or indifference, bozoism, smugness. And these people were smug. They thought they had it all right, you know, and everything. And the people were in that general way. They, were, they just got to the place where they ignored God. They only had a surface acknowledgement to the Lord. And it went as far that the priests and the people even questioned the existence of God. And certainly if there was a God, a God of Israel, he had forgotten them, and at the bare minimum, he didn't love them. That was the sum of their thinking. They were, in effect, spiritually bankrupt, spiritually destitute. So the prophecy of Malachi, in verse 1 there, look at that, is an oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. Now the name Malachi, and this is the only place we know of Malachi, the name Malachi means messenger, God's messenger, and the oracle literally means burden, the burden of the word of the Lord, and it carries the idea that if the messenger, you know, there will be great affliction on him if he doesn't faithfully deliver the message that he has been given to. And one commentator said, whenever oracle is used to designate a prophetic utterance, it's always the utterance that is threatening and judgmental. In nature. So Malachi is delivering a heavy, burdensome message, a judgmental message to the Jews that were living in Jerusalem. Now, as we said earlier, the people had rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. They had rebuilt the city mostly. They had rebuilt the wall around the city. And now the people were settled much in the land. However, the rest of the land, the land that we call Palestine, but it was really originally the land of Canaan, 
Um, that land had far from being restored, and there was not much going on. And the, again, the people were just kind of getting complacent. In fact, the overwhelming majority had been in any kind of allegiance to the Lord at all. And the priests, the so-called spiritual leaders, they were totally apostate. And they were a complete state of disobedience from the law that they, and their worship was evidence of that. Now, Malachi's oracle begins with the covenant-keeping, covenant-making, covenant-keeping God defending his love for Israel, which is utterly amazing in, in that fact. He says, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have I loved you? And then the Lord goes about explaining how he loved Jacob and hated Esau how he loved his chosen people, Israel. And then the Lord said one could easily look at the history of those two nations that came out from Esau and Jacob. Uh, And and the nation Israel, by far, received the blessings of God to prove that he did indeed love them. And here is Edom, which was the descendants of Esau, who he did not choose, uh, but they, God poured out his curses on them. And then basically, there was no question at who God loved. And verses 4 and 5 explain Edom's judgment. It describes the destruction of Edom's and Edom's inability to do anything about it. So the Lord's deductive point, God out of his grace and mercy, and when we talk about grace and mercy, it was enormous for the nation Israel. But he loved Jacob. He loved Israel that came out of Jacob. He still loves Israel. He will always love Israel. Case closed. God has that special unconditional love for them because that was the unconditional covenant that God made with Abraham. And he will surely bless Israel, the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have loved Jacob, declares the Lord. Now, the second question raised, and and this really illustrates Israel's spiritual ruin, and this is where we want to be. This is the worthless worship. The Lord opens up with a statement of principle, and he's addressing the priest, the so-called spiritual leaders. Verse 6, a son honors his father and a servant his master. And here the Lord is reminding the priest that a son, as a rule, gives honor to his father. And a servant, or a slave, literally, gives honor to his master. And the word there, honors, means glory. If one is a son, the normal response to his father is one of glorification. Okay? The same is true for a servant or a slave. He is to treat his master with honor and respect. And he is to glorify his master in what he does, in obedience. Now the question then, why is the Lord of hosts addressing Israel as a son And why is he addressing them as a servant? Good question. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, the Lord said about Israel, Out of Egypt I called my son, that nation, Israel. In Exodus chapter 4, God speaks of Israel as his son. In Jeremiah chapter 31, in verse 9, he says the same thing. With weeping they will come, and my supplication I will lead them. I will make them walk by streams of water on a straight path in which they will not stumble. For I am a father to Israel. And then in Isaiah chapter 42, the Israel is said to be the servant of Jehovah God, the slave of Jehovah God. The Lord not only sovereignly selected them, he elected them in order that someday Israel might all be saved as Paul says in Romans chapter 11, from the wrath of God being poured out on sin and sinners. But he selected Israel and set them apart in order that they might honor God as a son and serve him as their master. They were to be a missionary nation to all the nations of the earth. And you know, in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says to those who were about to witness the ascension into heaven... Uh, you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. That language comes from the prophecy of Isaiah. It's a, that, uh, that is a part of the Jewish 
purpose that he selected them. They were to be a son. They were to be a servant to their master, to the one true living God. And you know what? You and I, even though we live in the church age, which of course has not replaced Israel, but we are not elected just to be saved from sin and the wrath of God being poured out on sin and sinners. I mean, in order to have salvation. We're not just saved for salvation. We're not elected by God to rest in the pew or uh, the theater seats. All right? I mean, we're not, we don't, we're not that, we're, that's not why we're saved. We're elected by God for service. And if we're not serving our Lord with sacrificial service within the local church, the Lord will ask us the same question he's asking Israel here. If I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my respect? Well, God is not getting honor from Israel. And he's not getting respect and reverence. He's not receiving glory from them. And so in spite of the Lord's love to Israel, the priests have manifested a total lack of love toward him. In fact, they have displayed just the opposite, and their actions demonstrated their hatred of the Lord, their contempt for the Lord, their disdain toward him. And their clueless question is this, but you say, how have we despised your name? By the way, God's name is holy. How have we despised your name? And here's the Lord's answer, verse 7. You are presenting defiled food upon my altar. Defiled food? What is that? I mean, this is, this is about as low as you can get. And if we really want to get the grasp of this, I want you to turn back to Leviticus chapter 22. Leviticus chapter 22. And, and, and here the Lord gives Moses some very clear conditions that he's laid out for the priest. And, of course, Moses' brother Aaron was the head of the priest. But Leviticus chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Aaron, Aaron as being the father of the Levitical priest, and he was to be in charge of all the sacrifices that were given uh, at this particular time in the tabernacle. Tell Aaron and his sons to be careful with the holy gifts of the sons of Israel, which they dedicate to me, so as not to profane my holy name. I am the Lord. In other words, anything done in name of worship is a very, very serious matter. Demonstrating more than anything else, this is the high view of God, is it not? He is a holy God, a righteous God. His name is holy. And that has to be paramount in one's life so that he, so he has to be supreme in the mindset of the priest. That has to be right at the top. So he has to be careful how they worship the Lord of hosts. And by the way, that, that phrase, the Lord of hosts, in Malachi, in, in, this, in the verses 6 through 14 that we're covering, that, that name is used... Uh, uh, seven times and 23 times in the entire book. And it emphasizes the infinite authority of the, God, of the Lord Almighty. Authority. You know, sometimes we don't like authority, do we? But God is authoritative. He is the Lord of hosts. Now, in regard to the sacrifice, look what the Lord told Moses later on. Leviticus chapter 22, verses 17 through 20. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying... Speak to Aaron and to his sons and to all the sons of Israel and say to them, any man of the house of Israel or the aliens in Israel who presents his offering, whether it is any of their votive, and votive means something that they made an oath for, that they would uh, consecrate it to fulfillment of that oath. Anyone who presents his offering, whether it is any of their votive or any of their free will offerings, which they present to the Lord for a burnt offering, for you to be accepted, it must be made without defect from the cattle, the sheep, or the goats. Whatever has defect, you shall not offer, for it will not be accepted for you. Case closed. Go back to Malachi chapter 1. So God made it abundantly clear from the very beginning that he is not interested at all in any kind of sacrifices that would be substandard. Why? Because that would unmistakably reveal the true character of the one offering 
the sacrifice. And that true character would be one who would not please God. And that's disrespecting God. Now let's look at this then. Verse 7. You are presenting defiled food upon my altar, or literally on my altar you are bringing forth defiled food. Now what is defiled food? What does the Lord of hosts mean by that? Well, the sacrifices that were brought forth and presented on the altar, sacrifices that were designed to present the, you know, they were designed to present the ultimate sacrifice in the future. And of course, the ultimate sacrifice in the future would be God's own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is in effect, he was the perfect and ultimate sacrifice. And the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ emphasizes it expresses total obedience, doesn't it? Total obedience to the Father. Remember, Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane the, the night before he was crucified, or, or the same day maybe, he prayed, Abba, Father, all the things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus was obedient he himself was the perfect, unblemished sacrifice. And God sacrificed his own son, and in his own son, in perfect obedience, carried out that sacrifice. And therefore, that suffering, that sacrifice was untainted, pure, unblemished. And God was totally satisfied with that offering. He was totally pleased with that offering. Because that sacrifice of his own son absorbed the full wrath which was being poured out on sin and sinners. Thus, therefore, that sacrificial offering that Jesus made is representative of God's very own holy character, and it's also representative of Jesus' perfect character. And it was a perfect sacrifice. And actually, that is what all the offerings and sacrifices in the Old Testament economy were supposed to represent. And when they brought a perfect, unblemished animal, the very best animal they had, it was a sacrifice that was in effect saying, the animal is my substitute, accept it on my behalf. Now, we need to be clear here. The Old Testament sacrificial system did not save anybody. Nobody was ever saved by bringing an acceptable sacrifice. Uh, you know, Sacrificial offerings were done in order for those who were generally saved by grace through faith. Not in what they did, but what they believed. And this was obedient belief. And those who were saved by faith, and there was always just a few, a remnant, always a remnant, but they came to understand that these sacrifices represented the, the redemptive work that the Messiah would do in the future. And that is why God gave them the system, so that they would be prepared when the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, would come. Okay, you with me on that? So when the sacrifices were offered in faith, God took delight in them because of those sacrifices express the aspects of the future ministry of the Lord Jesus, and it was a manifestation of their true hearts, their obedient hearts. Back to verse 7. The Lord says, You are presenting defiled food upon my altar, but you say, how have we defiled you? In that you say the table of the Lord is to be despised. The table of the Lord is the altar. Now, this is in the Old Testament system. But here's the point. When one would bring a defiled food and put it on the altar, he, in every sense of the word, defiles the Lord himself. That's the Lord's table. And they despise the table because they brought it unfit sacrifice. And then the Lord gives a little more explanation there in verse 8. And here's what defiled food is. But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you present the lame and, and sick, is that not evil? Now these priests would agree that a blind animal or a lame animal or a sick animal, that would not meet the standard that was set they might even think themselves it was evil and defiled, but in their gross, blundering, self-serving way, they were trying to make distinction between the so-called sacrificial offering and the Lord. I mean, they were trying to say, well, it really doesn't matter. And that can't be done. 
Listen to me. If one does not give his best to the Lord of hosts, then obviously the Lord of hosts is certainly not best in his life, period. The Lord of hosts is definitely not a priority in that one's life. Matter of fact, the Lord of hosts has been dishonored greatly. I mean, when one does that, when one does not give his very best, he actually considers God the Lord of hosts to be less than the best. See, the Lord of hosts is the almighty, powerful God. He's the creator of the universe. He's the one who chooses whom he wants for his own purpose, for his own glory, for his own honor, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1. God is the Almighty. And if anybody gives him anything, then their best is an affront to him. It dishonors him. And that gives his glory to someone or something else other than God. And that's what is being said here. Where's my honor? Where's my glory? Where's my respect? Look how you despise my name. Look how you defile my altar. Look how you despise me. Now, the real issue here is that the people were offering up animals to the Lord that were really of no use to them. In other words, they were bringing animals to the Lord of hosts uh, to be sacrificed that were actually worthless. They were offering cast-off animals. And these wicked priests were consenting to this. Cannot believe it. And by allowing this, what they were really saying is, it's no big deal, who cares? Who cares what we give the Lord? You know, who knows the difference anyway? We'll just go through the motions. We'll just play the game. That's probably all that God expects, if there really is a God at all. That's where they were at. Well, that kind of attitude really displeases the Lord, of course. In fact, that kind of attitude that would allow for that kind of sacrifice for worship angers the Lord of hosts. And you, and you see, what was really important here is the attitude of the heart. I mean, it isn't there. We are to give the Lord the best. Not second best, not third best. Not the leftovers. Not something we don't need anymore. But we are to give Him the best. And we see this brilliantly illustrated in Jesus' ministry. You know the story of the widow, the, the widow, at, and as Jesus was watching over the treasury in the temple, and he was watching people put money in the collection, and the widow came along and she put in two mites. And a mite was the coin of the smallest value. Maybe in our present monetary values, it would amount to about $2 or so. I don't know. But it wasn't very much. But that, all, that was all the widow had. And you remember what the Lord Jesus said about her offering? It was greater than all the rest put together. Take all the gifts, the, the rich and the middle class and the upper lower class, put them all together, and those two little mites that the widow threw in are more than all of them offered. Because she gave everything she had. Well, the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty, knows the heart, right? He knows your heart. He knows my heart. He looks upon the heart. And so he asked three heart-penetrating questions to the priest. End of verse 8. Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you if you offered him that? Would he receive you kindly? And the Hebrew here is very expressive. Would he lift up your face? That's what it literally means. The idea here is if you would give the governor what you're giving me, would the governor be pleased with you? Would he lift up your face? Would he be pleased to receive you into his presence with that kind of gift? And the obvious answer is no. Not in any way, shape, or form. And this is the Lord's scathing answer. Verse 9. But now will you not entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us? Literally, with such an offering on your, your part, 
Will God's heart be softened so that he will be kind to us? You couldn't please the governor with those offerings. How do you expect to please me with that offering? Pretty ridiculous, isn't it? And of course, this is very sarcastic. I think we get the drift there. Why not try that nonsense on the Lord if you do that to the governor? I mean, you would never do that on the governor. And then he says in verse 10, Oh, that there be, were one, one among you who would shut the gates that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. And we have to understand that the Lord God specifically commanded them to bring offerings. But he intended them to bring offerings from sincere hearts. To bring offerings that would please the Lord, to honor him, to bring reverence and respect to him. And if they were sin offerings, they were to be confessing their sin, right? That's the point there. And, and they were not doing any of this. They were just out there going through the motions. Confessing to God your sin and knowing that He has a restoration for you. But they were just saying, don't bother. I mean, don't bother with bringing good stuff. And He says, don't bother bringing them. Now, the prophet Isaiah records what the Lord said to Sodom and Gomorrah in Isaiah chapter 1. He said, when you come to appear before me who requires of you this trampling of my courts... Bring your worthless offerings no longer, because incense is an abomination to me. In other words, that fragrant aroma that God instructed Moses to concoct now smells like garbage. It stinks. He says, I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. So what the Lord is saying through the prophet Isaiah, if you come meetings to the Lord and come without any sense of acknowledgement of your need for forgiveness, if you come without repentance, if you come without faith, if you come with a, without a sincere desire to worship the Lord of hosts, it's just as well that you don't come at all. And you know what? Even in the church age, that could be true. I mean, it could be applicable to you and me. We can go to many assemblies, right? We can go to many church services, and we sometimes don't even know why we're there. Shoot, we might be planning a trip. Or thinking about the new room on the house. Or perhaps we're even thinking in our minds what I'm going to do to get ready for tomorrow. Many of us are guilty of that. So the Lord says to Israel, and it can certainly apply to us, if you can't come with the right attitude of worthy worship, it's just as well that you don't come at all. Well, the Lord concludes this section through his messenger Malachi by saying in verse 11, For from the rising of the sun even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense is going to be offered to my name, and a grain offering is pure. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Now, in light of the context of this oracle, this burdensome message, at this particular time in history, that there's no offering of incense <laughs> of the Lord anywhere except in Jerusalem, in the land. It's not, this, is, this is not happening there, the land of Canaan. Um, and they had to be offered in Jerusalem. That was the only place there was to offer them. So what is this referring to is this is referring to the future. This is referring to the earthly millennial kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom, when Christ will come again and set up his kingdom on the throne of David. So Malachi is saying on behalf of the Lord, it's a serious thing for you to carry out this ritualistic, formalistic type of worship because I am a great God. Let's not forget that. And the time is coming when all the inhabitants of the earth are going to be worshiping me. And my name is going to be great among all of them. And they're going to be bringing me pure offerings. And your attitude now is entirely contrary to what's going to happen in the future, where the Messiah will rule and reign. 
And then in light of that, the Lord turns his attention to that contrary attitude of the priest. Verse 12, but you are profaning it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled. In other words, when they bring the lame animal or the blind animal or the sick animal or the worthless animal and put the animal on the altar, they're saying in effect that the altar of the Lord is a despised thing. And so they will offer that which they despise on that altar, and that means they despise God. So their actions speak loudly and clearly. And their actions clearly manifest the true character. They really did despise the Lord, and they were treating him as common. They were putting these things on the altar, disregarding his greatness. Now the Lord further indicts the priests, as he says, and they're further profaning the altar. He says, middle of verse 12, the table of the Lord is defiled, as so as for the fruit it is food to be despised. Now, as many of you know, this, this was kind of a personal thing for the priest. The priest lived off of the offerings that were brought. What wasn't put on the altar, they, they used to consume themselves. They didn't have any land or anything like that, so, so that's how they survived. The, the, the people brought them, and that's the point. But so the point here is that, that the fruit that was being there is second-class fruit, worthless fruit, worthless offerings, and the priests then have to take what that is left, and that left a bad taste in their mouth, literally. And so they're suffering from the consequences of these lame, sick, blind animals. And you see, this was happens when the spiritual leaders lose respect for the truth of God's Word. This morning we sang, Aaron even mentioned that the wonderful words of life Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty teach me faith and duty. The Word of God is there for clear instruction. And the priests were ignoring it. And sooner or later, because the priests were ignoring it, the people, they got off of the so-called worship. And thus, that is why they say in verse 13, that the priests would say, my, how tiresome it is. Because now, being a priest becomes nothing but a chore. There's no reward to it at all. There's no joy to it at all. You know, and I don't say this to pontificate, but I work hard at studying the word of the Lord. And it's the greatest joy I have. It's not a chore. It's joy. But now these priests are saying, my, how tiresome it is to be a priest. And you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of Horse. That means to breathe in contempt. It's kind of like one of my granddaughters. And now she reacts to me, and I won't name her because she's here this evening. But she's Josh and Jana's second child. But anyway, they lived for, with us for a while. And when I would be out working in that yard that Linda has me doing, all those things that she has commanded me to do, when I would come in and dirty and sweaty in the summertime, not now, but in, you know, just come in, and I would immediately try to hug her. And she would go, you, you stink. You know, she would touch me just a little bit. Well, the ministry gets tiresome, and it begins to stink. And that's how the priests were looking at their roles. And then the Lord says, And you bring what was taken by robbery and what is lame or sick, so you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your land, says the Lord? In other words, this is nothing but one big, huge charade one big pretense, one big hypocritical travesty. 
And here's the example of that kind of hypocrisy, verse 14. But cursed be the swindler who has male in his flock and vows it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. Here's a man who's even trickier than some of the others. He has this beautiful male in his flock without blemish. And so he would vow that to the Lord. He would say a vow. And in order to make his vow valid, he would then say he was going to offer that animal without blemish as a sacrifice. However, when it came time to offer it as a sacrifice, he didn't offer the one without blemish. Instead, he offered one that was blemished. And he was a trickster. That's literally what that Hebrew word means. Well, that one's going to be cursed. You know, we all have our own way of doing things, don't we? I've heard many people say, well, I have my own religion. Or I have my own faith. Or I have my own way. That's a trickster. And that one will be cursed. Woe to that one. As Jesus said, he will spend eternity in hell. And really, what that guy wanted, he wanted to look like he was spiritual. I mean, he was kind of like Ananias and Sapphira. He wanted to be known as a person who really did things for the Lord, but when it came down, he cheated because he had a high view of himself and a low view of God. A very low view of the Lord of hosts. So he sacrificed a blemished animal to the Lord, but the Lord of hosts is a great king. And the Lord of hosts says, My name is feared among the nations. You know, that word fear, it means reverence and respect, but it also means scared. In other words, if one's sacrificial offering is directly related to the greatness of God, God is to be feared because he is great. Well, let's conclude our time together tonight. We're starting by saying again, as we start out, what one thinks about God is the most important thing about him. And how one views God has an impact on every other area of his life. And in light of that, do we then really view the Lord of hosts as our Father? Do we then really view the Lord of hosts as our Master? If that's indeed the case, then would the Lord be justified in asking us the same questions that he asked the Israelites? If I am your Father, where is my honor? If I am your Master, where is my respect? Do we, as Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, which Aaron repeated tonight, present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is our spiritual service of what? Worship. Do we give the Lord a host our all? Do we give the Lord a host our best? Do we really and truly worship God? Because again, what we think about God reflects in how we worship God. So then what is our worship like? Worthy or worthless? Would our worship be contemptible? Would the Lord of hosts say to us, I'm not pleased with you, nor will I accept an offering from you, nor will I accept your worship because your worship falls way short of presenting yourselves totally to God. Which is your reasonable service of worship. Now, if you're here this evening and you have never turned from your sin and sinfulness and placed your faith in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry to say your worship is indeed worthless. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is 
and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And that it means that if you're, can, you can become a true worshiper even tonight. And you can be one who worships in spirit and truth. And all you have to do is recognizing that standing before a holy and righteous God, you are a wretched sinner deserving of hell. And that Jesus Christ, God the Son, left the glories of heaven and was born in the human race for the express purpose of dying a horrible and horrendous death on a cross to be a sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice. And in doing that, he endured the full wrath of God being poured out on sin and sinners. We can't even imagine that. And the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, rose again. He's victorious over sin. And he's victorious over death. And by simply accepting what God did for us through his son, you, me, all of us can have become a child of God, have all of our sins forgiven, and have a new life, a transformed life. An eternal life in his very presence. The alternative is to have an existence in eternal hell for all eternity. The lake of fire, the second death. Well, may the Spirit of God through the Word of God drive these profound truths deep into our hearts and minds. Stake those hearts and minds and bow them before the great God who has a great name. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for Malachi. Even though he delivered to Israel a burdensome message, a judgmental message, a message of the wrath to come. But in that message is a plea for Israel to turn from their sin, repent, and trust in the living God. And that message is for us today as we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, I solemnly pray that there will be no one here this evening that leaves this auditorium that is not saved by grace through faith, saved from the wrath of God to come, and will get to spend eternity in the presence of the living God. Lord, we pray these things in the name of the one who did die for us and rose again to give us new life. Amen.